All right. Well, what I want to talk about tonight um, is a message that uh, for those of you who uh, who have read my books and uh, listened to me uh, regularly, you've heard uh, you've heard me talk about some of uh, what I'm going to share on tonight. But tonight, I really felt like. I really felt like uh, the Lord wanted me to talk about the, uh, the power of forgiveness and, uh, and the power of forgiveness to, to transform your life, to set you free. And also, I, I really at the same time, because you kind of got to see both sides of the coin to really understand, also the power of unforgiveness to completely lock you up and destroy your destiny. You know, a lot of times people are pretty nonchalant about bitterness uh, pretty relaxed about holding unforgiveness in their life. And uh, we get hurt and we get mad and we carry stuff and we're pretty sure we're justified because this shouldn't have happened and it wasn't right and I didn't deserve it. And so we kind of, uh, we pick up uh, bitterness, we can pick up unforgiveness, we can uh, carry some of this stuff and uh, we don't realize that uh, what we're doing is we're just drinking poison. And, uh, and it's wrecking us. It will wreck our hearts. It'll wreck our lives. And it keeps us from being and do, being what God wants us to be, going where God wants us to go. And so I just determined a long time ago, as I started to really understand how my own unforgiveness in my life, uh, how it was affecting me and what it was costing me, I just made up my mind a long time ago, I'm not going to hold anything against anybody. And I don't care what you do to me, uh, I'm going to forgive you. Even if I don't like you, even if I don't trust you, I, even if I don't forgive you for you, I'll forgive you for me because I am absolutely unwilling to live below God's high place and high level for my life. And I know that that's exactly what unforgiveness does. And so I want to talk about that tonight and particularly also want to talk about spiritual prisons. How many have heard me talk about this before? Or maybe you've read my book. Um, until 1999, uh, I lived very much. And this is what is that? That's 24 years ago. Till 1999, I lived very much in a spiritual prison. And uh, did uh, obviously I wouldn't have used that language. I hadn't even heard that phrase before. All I knew was I didn't feel very free. And all through my childhood, I just uh, I just remember just feeling locked up. I didn't know why, but I just couldn't connect with people. I was. Uh, I was always uh, kind of the, the, the recluse. I was always the odd man out. I never didn't connect naturally with kids. I can look back and a couple of friends that I had uh, through childhood, but they were kind of very much like me. Uh, awkward, uncomfortable kids who didn't connect with others and you kind of bump into each other and it's like, okay, we're both awkward. Let's hang out, you know, but even, even us, we didn't connect at a very deep, deep level. You see some young people, how they just have these deep, close, intimate friendships and this deep bond of love. I never had that growing up. And, uh, and I didn't know why I didn't connect with people, didn't make sense to me, but uh, it was just the way it was. And uh, I was always nervous, I was always insecure, I was never confident in relationships. Uh, I was saying, I think, to the youth the other day, I always got nervous around girls, I was just so absolutely bashful. And, uh, and they really didn't like me, so it was very easy for me to just stay away. And, uh, and that was just kind of my way. And I remember even uh, as I Later on, I, start, I kind of walked away from the Lord in my teen years and got into a little bit of trouble, but uh, came back to the Lord uh, when I was about 19 years old and, uh, and decided I wanted to be in ministry. I wanted to be a preacher of the gospel, and I went to Bible school. But even in Bible school, I was just so absolutely locked up, wouldn't be connect with others uh, even there was a few, I remember there was a couple of Bible school students who tried to pull me in. I think they felt sorry for me, you know, but I was just such a loner and they, they would invite me to their study groups or whatever. But I just found being around people, uh, just made me feel, I was just unnerved. I remember even, uh, even when I was in Bible school, I got, I was staying in this house with, uh, like three other, stu three other, uh, they weren't Bible school students. They were just other guys from, from university, but three other Christian guys. 
and we kind of all rented this house, and I had one room, and they had their rooms, and I would come into the house, and they're watching TV or chit-chatting in the kitchen and whatnot. I would always just go to my room, and I would just sit in my room, and almost, it almost felt like I was just always hiding from people, and, uh, and come out for a minute, and then leave, and, but even just hearing people in the next room would sometimes make me feel jittery. So I'd go out, go for a drive, go for a walk. I, I, I just like to be alone. Uh, I started camping a lot during that time. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't ever into camping or hunting or anything like that as a kid because I didn't have a father to teach me those things. But around Bible college days, I started going out and buying uh, all the most expensive camping gear I could find. I got nice tents and sleeping bags and all this stuff. And I started going out into the woods and uh, I just loved being alone. I needed to be alone. It was the only time that I felt peace was when I was totally alone. I loved the Lord, but I needed to be alone. And uh, I remember one time I bought this really, really nice tent. Well, it wasn't a tent. It was actually called a bivy sack. Anyone know what a bivy sack is? It's like a garbage bag that you pull over top of your sleeping bag. (laughs) So it's like a one-man sleeping bag, you know? But it was like 800 bucks because it was made out of Gore-Tex. It was like the the nicest bivy sack money could buy. And uh, I bought this bivy sack and I thought, I, think I, was, I, I got home and I, I, the guys are in the next room talking and, and I'm just like, I think I'm going to go sleep in the backyard. So I went out into the backyard and slept in this bivy sack. And just being out of the house and away from those people just felt so peaceful. And so I slept out there and then, then I, thought, I slept out there the next night and then the next night and then the next night. And after about a week, I thought, what do I even pay rent for? And I actually moved out, I canceled my rent. Now, I also knew, I'll tell you this, I knew that I was going to be going on a mission trip to Ethiopia in about two months. And so I knew I wasn't going to be homeless forever, but I thought, you know what? I'm just going to be homeless for a couple months. And, uh, and so I actually sl- started sleeping. I'm a Bible college student. By the way, I'm on staff at a Pentecostal church in Edmonton. I'm the junior high youth pastor at this Pentecostal church, and I'm sleeping in the golf course across the road from the church, <laughs> out in the trees for about two months, I think it was. Some of the kids, would, they would look out the window, oh, that's where Pastor Steve Prince sleeps. So, <laughs> and so I was actually homeless uh, for a couple months, so homeless, not broke, but just homeless. Uh, not because I couldn't afford it, but because I just absolutely couldn't stand being around people. And so it was, it was getting worse as I got older. You know, now I'm 19 years old and I'm just getting awkwardly reclusive away from people. Now I'd still get up, I teach, I have my little junior highs and I do my little lessons and, and they like listening to me. And, uh, and, and I, I found that if I really worked at it and prepared myself, I actually enjoyed speaking. I enjoyed speaking and preaching and whatnot. But as soon as I was done, boom, I was out of there. There was no relationships. I remember even uh, the youth pastor who was over me um, getting so frustrated with me because he wanted to connect. He wanted to build a relationship. He wanted to mentor me. He wanted to pour into my life. But I was always pushing him away. I just couldn't get close to the guy. His name was Graydon. And uh, eventually, he, uh, he wanted to fire me because he just couldn't connect with me. And uh, he went to the pastor, the senior pastor, Bob Gal. Anyone want to know about Bob Gal? He told Bob Gal he wanted to fire me, and Bob said, "No, you're not allowed." <laughs> he, Bob liked me, you know. He saw something, and uh, and so so. But this is how it was. I just couldn't connect. And uh, it was at that time of my life that uh, I was going to Ethiopia on this mission trip. But I heard about this camp that was going to be held in Sylvan Lake. And uh, it was a pastor's camp. And uh, I'd heard that the last few years had been pretty wild. Like people were really encountering God. There was a lot of manifestations of the Spirit. I heard that they had people who were called apostles and prophets, which was like absolutely new language to me at the time. And uh, I didn't even know what I thought of that. But I just wanted to go somewhere different, somewhere cool, something not what I was used to. And so I... I, um, registered to go to this camp. And uh, when I got there, I went out into this, everyone else, all the other pastors were staying in this, like they had like this big, it's like a hotel out there, sort of like a, a big dorms or whatever. I chose, just because I couldn't stand being that close to people, I chose to camp in my little bivy sack 
out in the middle of the field. But because nobody else camped, I was the only tent. I was the only tent in the middle of this field. And so here's all these pastors, 500 pastors at this pastor's camp. And then there's my little bivy sack, lonely, out in the middle of this field. And, uh, and the first night, I got to the service. And the first night, the speaker was a man named Dennis Weidrich. How many you know Dennis? Just an amazing, great, godly man. And uh, he got up to preach. And uh, he, I, I can't even remember what he was preaching on. But I just remember as he was preaching the word, my heart was just vibrating inside of me. And I wanted so badly. Uh, whatever it was he was preaching on, I can't remember, but I just wanted it. And I, when he started, got to the end, he said, I want to pray for some people right now. And he started to have an altar call. And as soon as he called it, I was in the back uh, back row, I just darted. I was like running to the front, but 300 people all had the same passion and they all jumped into the aisles first and the whole place filled and the aisles were full and I was still like halfway back through the aisle and the, the thing was full. And so I'm standing back here thinking, oh man, he's never going to pray for me. And I, I really want him to touch me. I want him to lay hands on me. And so I'm way back here thinking, this is horrible. You know, how am I going to get this guy to pray for me? And, uh, he started to step down off the stage to minister to people. And when he got to like the first step, he kind of looked at everyone and he was doing that, where do I start? And he looked down the aisle and he saw me. And his eyes went up. Oh, he's looking at me. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> like, he, he, he's, excuse me, and he started pushing through the crowd. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's like coming right for me. And that's exactly what he did. He pushed past like 30 or 40 people just to get to me. And when he got to me, he said, young man, when I saw you, I felt the Lord gave me a word for you. Is it okay if I shared it? I said, yes, please, you know? And he said, well, what I heard the Lord saying is, you're living, this is how Dennis talks, just so you know. He talks kind of like a, like a, like a, like a grade seven teacher, you know? <laughs> he says, what the Lord said to me was that you are living in a spiritual prison. And I said, okay. I had no clue what that meant, you know? And uh, he says, uh, you've been living in this prison for a very long time. And he said, uh, what, what is happening is it's keeping you from having relationships with others. He said, what's interesting is, he said, with your spiritual life, I have to give you top marks because Jesus visits you in your prison all the time. You love the Lord. I said, I do. He said, you love him and he's close to you and he visits you and you commune and it's beautiful. But he says, when it comes to your soul life, I have to give you really low marks. Just this exactly how he talks really low marks, because he said in the realm of the soul, which is you connecting with others and how you relate to other people, he says, it's just non-existent. He says, you don't have any friends, do you? And I said, no, I don't. He says, you don't even date, do you? And I said, no, I don't. He says, you feel pretty much alone all the time, everywhere you go. Even in, full of a, in a crowd full of people, you feel all alone. Isn't that right? I said, yeah. He said, you're living in a spiritual prison. And it's keeping you from connecting with others. It's keeping you from your destiny. And he said, and the reason why you're living in this spiritual prison. He got all this prophetically. He said, the reason why you're living in this spiritual prison. Because in your back pocket, you got a big stack of IOUs. And almost all of them are towards your father. He says, you have unforgiveness towards your father because he owed you some things. And every time he wasn't there for you and every time you needed him and he wasn't there, you just wrote an IOU. And all through your life, you've been writing these IOUs for all the times he wasn't there. And you walk around with a stack of IOUs in your back pocket. And he says, young man, I'm sorry to say, until you forgive your father, until you tear up those IOUs, you will live in this spiritual prison for the rest of your life. And he said, God bless you. And he turned around and walked away. That happened. He says, God bless you. And he turned around and walked away. It was just like, open me up like a can of worms. And then walked away and he started praying for someone else. 
Well, it was a week-long camp. That was the first day. And uh, I remember walking around that week, and it was interesting. The next day, there was like this, they have these prophets, which is, this is totally new to me, you know? How many have never met a prophet? Oh, you got to. They're fun. Uh, but there was this prophet, and you could like make an appointment with a prophet. I'm like, what? You can just do that? Like, that, I didn't even know if I liked that. Even if it felt biblical to me. You know, I'm like, you just make an appointment with a prophet. Oh, yeah, yeah, just here you go. You can get a time slot. Here, I'm on 1145. So I'm like, okay, sure, I'll do it, you know. And so I show up, and I walk into the room with this prophet. They call him a prophet. And as soon as I walked in, he looked at me and said, why are you so afraid to fall in love? And I said, uh, let's not go there. He said, that's where we're going. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. Why did I come to the prophet, you know? And uh, anyways, he ministered to me. That was quite powerful. And, uh, and then, but then through that week, I just, I just walked around. I and mean, the messages were great. But uh, all through that week, I just couldn't stop thinking about Dennis's words, about me living in a spiritual prison, and about the unforgiveness towards my father. And I knew he was right, because my fa- that, that, was, that was the biggest issue in my life. My father committed suicide when I was nine months old. Uh, he was in a skidoo accident, uh, wasn't wearing a helmet, bashed his head, and, uh, and he ended up getting brain damage. And then uh, a few months later, when I was nine months old, he, uh, he took his own life. And so all through my childhood, I had a stepdad, but he didn't really, uh, he didn't really seem to like me very much. And uh, we didn't really connect. But uh, all through my childhood, um, I, just, I, just, I just knew I was deprived because I didn't have a father. And I had other friends who had fathers and they would do things with them. I had friends who, their fathers would take them golfing. I had friends whose fathers would take them camping and make fires and do all of these things. And I often felt just like I was lacking because of that. And so even when I was a young guy, you know, just uh, even trying to get into sports, I was horrible at sports and try to try out for some team, but you can't throw a ball. And, uh, and you know, do you, how many of you remember picking teams? You know, it's like, oh my gosh, the dread of just, I wish the teacher would just say one, two, one, two, one, two. No, that's not ever how they did it. They picked the two coolest guys in the room. And, and then say, okay, you pick teams and you just know. I'm going to get picked last, you know, and I'm not good at sports and I'm clumsy and I grew too fast and I wasn't very, uh, but, but I also never had a father to throw a ball with me or, or to do any of these things. And so I just wasn't good. I had no coordination. And, and so I'm just like, oh, all I was saying, I don't expect to be picked first or fifth. All I'm praying is just not last. Anything but last. You know, I don't mind being second or third last, but just not last. And I remember, not every time, but more times than not. It'd be down to like the last two or three. And I remember many times where it's like the last two and I'm standing there just feeling like such a dork and they'd pick the other guy. And then the, other, the guy who got me would be like, Ugh, you can have him too. No, 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 you have him. <laughs> Aww. Some would say, oh. <laughs> and you know, in those moments, Dad, where were you? You know, this is your job. Teach me how to throw a ball. Teach me how to catch. You know, this is your job. And Dad, write an IOU. You know, it's his fault. And it actually, throughout my whole life, it got very easy to just blame him for everything. You know, even stuff that wasn't probably necessarily his fault. But wherever there was a lack, I just blame it on him. Wherever I felt like I wasn't enough, I blame it on him. I remember even as a young man starting to go through puberty and noticing women in a whole new way. Did that happen to anyone here? Just, just confess. <laughs> all the half the room is lying. So, uh, and that's all the men. But uh, I remember. Struggling because I, I, I grew up in a Christian home and I didn't want to think thoughts that I was thinking. I didn't want to be having lustful imaginations. And I remember thinking I was such a dirtbag. But I wanted to have a pure heart and I wanted to be a good Christian. And uh, I remember like trying to overcome lustful thoughts. And uh, finally, I don't know, I was like 13 or 14 years old. You know, this is before I backslid and then I just didn't care. But when I was still young, I, I wanted to serve the Lord. And I remember 13 years old going to my mom 
because I had no man to go to. And uh, I went to my mom, so embarrassed, but I remember having this conversation. I said, hey, mom, I said, um, I got this friend <laughs> who's really struggling with lustful thoughts. I'm just wondering, is there a book or something that I could give to him? <laughs> and she's like, honey, are you okay? Oh, I'm doing good. You know me. <laughs> but it's a friend. She, my mom literally went to the Christian bookstore in Red Deer. I remember trying to find the lust book. <laughs> but they hadn't read that one. No one. There was no books on that back then. You know, this is back in the you know, late 80s. You know, no one, was, no one was talking about that kind of stuff. And I remember her coming home to me and saying, honey, I'm sorry I couldn't find a book on that subject. You know, is there anything you want to talk about? And I'm like, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. He'll be fine, you know. <laughs> but in my heart, I wrote another IOU. Where are you? I just needed a father just to say, hey, son, you're not messed up. You're not a pervert. Everything is working the way it's supposed to. This is natural, but let me teach you how to be a man of God. Hello? That's what I needed. Where was he? You know, and, and, and camping. Man, I wanted to hunt. I wanted to be a hunter. I wanted to kill animals and <laughs> gut them and skin them and eat the meat. Hallelujah. I do that with my sons now. <laughs> I had to teach myself when I, grew, when I got older. You know what I mean? Watch YouTube videos. But you know what? I wanted to hunt. I wanted to, uh, I didn't know how to build a campfire. Literally, you go out, you know, and kids, I didn't know how to build a campfire. I didn't know how to set up a tent. I didn't know how to do any of the things that a father is supposed to teach you. And so every time I bumped up against one of these circumstances in life where I felt like a loser because I didn't have what it took, I just wrote another IOU. I wrote another IOU. And so uh, by the time I met Dennis, you know, at age... I guess I was probably 24 at that time. This is August of 1999. Uh, I did. I just had a whole stack of IOUs, and, uh, and I wouldn't have said it to people because it would have sounded so ridiculous, and I don't want to sound like a, a victim. But in my heart, I blamed him for all sorts of stuff. And I'd be a different person if I had had a good father. And my dad, actually, who, who died, he was a hunter. He was a fisher. He was so many of the things that I wanted, you know. But he gave up on life. This is how I saw it. Killed himself, didn't love me enough, didn't care enough about me to stick around and raise me right. Left me and left my mom, my poor mom, who had two little boys and was pregnant at the time, to struggle through years of struggle. You know, a single mom with a reputation, of the husband who killed himself, and what that does to a woman, now you blame yourself. Well, I mean, maybe I'm not a good enough wife. Maybe I was, hello, all of these things that go through your head. And so I hated him for that too. How could you do that to my mom, my sweet, wonderful, beautiful mom? Who does that, you know, to their bride? You got to stick around and help the girl out. And so I had this stack. And, uh, and so I'm walking around this camp for a few days going, I know it's true, but what do I do? You know, how, what do I do with that? You know? And it was Thursday that same week at the pastor's camp. I was walking through the field and Dennis Wiedrich saw me from across the field and he, he called. He's like, hey, Steve, come here. I was just so happy he remembered my name. You know? And uh, I, I came over and he said, Stephen, tonight I'm going to be preaching on the subject of spiritual prisons. And what I love to do when I preach on this is I love to use someone as a model. And then they get healed and transformed, but it happens in front of the whole crowd. And then the whole crowd goes home, and then they know how to do this ministry for others. I was thinking, since you're living in such a horrible spiritual prison, <laughs> would you be willing? This is what he said. This, and this is actually how he talks, okay? This is how he talks. Would you be willing to be my model? <laughs> Well, I was like, I just love that he was, I just love, he was so anointed. Okay, the guy's just anointed. You know, feel the anointing on his life. And so, I mean, I was just happy to be ta having a conversation with this guy. He's even looking at me, talking to me. I said, let me, I, I'm not, I said, give me, give me a few hours to think about it, you know. 
And uh, I said, I'll let you know before the service. And, uh, and, and I went that, that afternoon and I, and I thought about it. And, and I came to the conclusion in my heart, first of all, I know this, is, I was certain this wouldn't, it wouldn't work, you know, like it's not going to change. I, but I'd never seen the power of, I've never seen inner healing ministry. You know, I, I wouldn't have taken it inner healing ministry seriously. I didn't think you can just be one way and then change. Like you just, everything's gradual, you know? So I, I didn't believe I could change. But I really liked Dennis, <laughs> and I really didn't want to disappoint him, and I, I wanted to have more connection with him, and so just that opportunity just to connect with him and just to make him happy, I just said to myself, you know what, even if nothing happens, you can just pretend you've been changed, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, I can always act like, oh yeah, I feel much better, you know, let him save face, <laughs> you know, how is anyone going to know if I've been set free from my prison or not, you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, I thought even if nothing happens, I can at least, you know, just kind of, you know, let them save face and uh, whatever. And I don't know anybody here anyways. Who cares, you know? And so uh, that night before the service, he he found me before the service and said, what do you say? I said, all right, I'll do it. And so uh, he started preaching. And uh, when he started preaching, he went to Matthew chapter 18, which is where Jesus teaches about spiritual prisons. And in Matthew 18, and he did a big, maybe we should do a little drama. You guys need to be woken up here. Um, He made a big drama. Dennis doesn't preach the Bible. He acts the Bible. He creates this big thing. And so he he tells the story, you know, and he was reading it, but I I can pretty much tell it from the the main points. It's basically, Jesus said, the, the kingdom of heaven, this is a kingdom message. He's explaining how kingdom principles work, okay? And he says, it's like a king. We need a king. Oh, look at this handsome king here. I need a very kingly figure. uh, Why don't you stand up here, O king? All right. King Bill. Jesus tells this story. He says, once upon a time, there was a king. And he decided he wanted to settle uh, accounts with his servants. Lots of people owed him money. Okay. And so uh, he found one guy who owed him... $20 $20 million. Oh my goodness. What's your name? Mike. Mike. Okay. You owe him $20 million. Sorry. Sorry. And Mike is called before the king and the king says, it's time to clear up your debt. Today you need to pay your bill back. And Mike didn't have $20 million. In fact, he didn't even have 2000 He didn't have 50 bucks. And so Mike fell on his knees before the king, began to kiss the king's feet, <laughs> And beg for mercy. Go ahead, just kiss his feet a little bit. (laughs) Beg for mercy. Well, thankfully, the king was a very merciful king. Well, and he patted him on the head and said, you know what, Mike? I'm in a good mood today. And he forgave him. Can you believe that? He forgave him for his debt of $20 million. Mike, you can stand up. You now owe him nothing. But you stay there. As Mike was going home, he happened to notice, what's your name? David. A guy, a servant who happened to owe him $20. And when he saw David, he ran to him and began to choke him. (laughs) Keep choking him. And he said to David, he said, where's that 20 bucks? Well, David fell on his feet before him. Go ahead. Began to kiss his feet. Beg for mercy. Just give me time and I'll pay you back. But Mike was not quite as merciful as the king. And Mike said, no. Absolutely not. You are going to the debtor's prison. Now, I, I need you. Come with me. I need, I need the strongest, toughest looking guys in the room. Yeah, you. Come over here. We're going to create a prison. All right, if you could come here, one more big, tough guy. Who's got some, who's got the biggest muscles in the room? Uh, You, yes, you, come, you, you're just what I was looking for. Come on, what's your name? All right, come here, you're you're, you're one of the jailers. All right, well, this is the prison. Well, Mike said, David, off to prison. And so David, come with me, yeah. He gets taken and thrown into the debtor's prison and he gets, you guys have to beat him up a little bit, torment him a little bit. 
Go ahead, torment him. Just poke him, punch him a little bit. You can give him a purple nurple if you want. And uh, where he has to stay in prison until he's paid back the 20 bucks, which you wouldn't think would take too long, but it's pretty hard to make money when you're in prison, isn't it? Well, guess what? One, two, come here. Some intercessors saw this whole thing and they were devastated. They ran to the king. They ran to the king and said, oh king, oh king. You'll never believe what we saw. That guy over there who you just forgave $20 million, he went down the street and beat this guy up, choked him, threw him in the prison over 20 measly dollars. Don't you wish you had these intercessors praying for you? All right, ladies, you can sit down, thank you. Well, the king was outraged, started pulling out his hair and spitting. <laughs> he was spitting mad. And he called for Mike to be brought back before him. Go ahead. And he said, Mike, af <laughs> after I forgive you for $20 million debt, you can't forgive him for 20 bucks? He says, I'm sorry. I've changed my mind. I'm reinstating your $20 million debt and you will be thrown into prison to be tortured. This is actually in the Bible, okay? To be tortured until you can pay back everything you owe. Off to prison. Guys, we need a little extra torture for this guy. Come on, let, it, let him have it. Go ahead, just. Oh, 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 oh. All right, can you give these guys a big hand? Thank you very much. And I want to read something to you. It's hard to believe this is in your Bible. But this is Matthew. After Jesus tells this parable, Jesus says, let's just, uh, this is Matthew 18. I'm going to go to, I need glasses. I am at that age now where I need glasses. I got these amazing ones. I'm showing the guys today. These are the really good ones. You don't get these for eight bucks at the drugstore. <laughs> these ones cost 15. <laughs> so, Matthew 18, verse 33. This is the king. He says, should you? Uh, actually, verse 32. Then he summoned him and his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Is there anyone here who has been forgiven for a lot? Anyone who's experienced the mercy of God? He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow slave? In the same way I had mercy on you. Verse 34, and his Lord, you know, I, sometimes it, I just wish it said the devil, but it doesn't. His Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And listen to this, verse 35, here's the clincher. My heavenly father will also do the same to you. Is that in the Bible? Is that in your Bible? My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. And Dennis, uh, he finished preaching that and, uh, and, uh, and just talked about how, this is what Jesus is saying, is that when you, you don't have to forgive anyone, you don't have to. Okay? People hurt you, people are mean to you, people did things wrong. You can hold a grudge if you want to. But here's the thing. Jesus is saying, this is how kingdom, the kingdom of God works. Okay? There's, like every other kingdom on the planet, there are rules. There are laws. There are kingdom laws. Okay? And God lives by his laws. He says, if you choose to live and to hold unforgiveness towards those who owe you, you will be locked up in a spiritual prison 
and it ain't going to be pretty. I mean, torturers. Like, how many people have lived their lives in spiritual prison? How many people have not, not known why they've experienced so much pain and so much difficulty in their life? That's not to say, I don't believe the angels are the torment, torturers. I believe that, that when we live in unforgiveness, we open ourselves up to the enemy. And uh, we open ourselves up to difficulty and to pain and challenges. And what Jesus says, this is how my father will treat each of you unless you forgive from your heart. And then when he was done preaching Matthew 18, he said, uh, now at this time, I'd like to invite Stephen up to the front because uh, I want to minister to him. And he, so he started, called me up. And, and when I got there, you know, I'm scared spitless now and I'm wishing I hadn't said yes. But 500 pastors standing there and he puts his arm around me and he says, now Stephen has been living in a spiritual prison all his life. And he had, before the service started, he had asked me for more details. So some of this wasn't prophetic. He had asked me, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? And I said, well, you're right. I did have unforgiveness towards my father. And I explained that he had committed suicide. And I told him some of these details. And he had asked me before the service, is it all right if I share some of these details? And I said, yeah, you can, you can share my story. And so he said, he's been living in a spiritual prison all his life. And the reason is because of, he's in the spirit, because of his spiritual, because of his father. And he, he sh shared about the suicide. Then he called up, I need two chairs. Then he, uh, he pulled two chairs up onto the, can you help me with this one? Sure. All right, I'm going to put these up here. Okay, give, put that one right here, but flip it around. Okay. So, there we go. He took two chairs. I don't want anyone falling off the stage. And, um, who's going to be my guinea pig tonight? <laughs> huh. I wonder. Uh, who would like to hug me for about 20 minutes? <laughs> oh, the kids, that's great. Oh. Okay, who, what guy would like to hug me? Who would let me? Come here, Mike. Is it Mike? No. Yeah, sorry. David, come up here. You're going to hug me whether you like it or not. Okay, so what, I want you to come sit right over here. David, is it? Yes. Thanks, sorry about that. So anyways, he put up two chairs and he said, uh, he asked me to sit in one and uh, he sat in the other one. And, uh, and I think the reason why he used two chairs is because it was a really comfortable way to hug someone for a very long time, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so, uh, I know, you don't mind, thank you. Very nice, <laughs> nurture, nurture. So anyways, he said, Steve, if you could just, uh, would you let me hug you? I'm like, yeah, okay. He never told me about any of this before the meeting. I'm like, so anyways, he holds me like this. And he says, Steve, he said, uh, now I, I know I'm not your father, okay? But, uh, but he said, I am an intercessor. And what an intercessor is, an intercessor is someone who stands in the gap on behalf of someone else. And he said, uh, I'm asking for your permission. Would you let me today stand in the gap for your father? And I said, uh, yep, okay. And so, uh, so he just held me like this. And, and he said, I just want you to imagine these IOUs that you got in your back pocket. And he said, we're going to go through some of them. And he said, uh, I remember he prayed this prayer. He, he started by just saying, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I'm asking that you would give me the privilege. Didn't sound like a privilege, but he said, would you give me the privilege of drinking the cup of Steve's father, Bernie Holmstrom? Would you allow me to be, would you allow me to be touched by his infirmities and his weaknesses? Would you allow me to taste his pain, his hurt, his shame, his brokenness? Holy Spirit, I make myself available to be an intercessor for Bernie Holmstrom. 
And then he said, now, Steve, I want to say to you, I know I'm not your father, but on behalf of your father, Bernie Holmstrom, as an intercessor, I want to stand in the gap for Bernie. And I want to say to you, son, I am so unbelievably sorry that all your life, even from your very first memories, I was never a part of it. I was never there. I see you just even as a little boy playing all by yourself, wishing you had someone to play with you. I see you alone in a little room uh, with their blocks building all by yourself. And son, oh, what I wouldn't do to have that opportunity to be with you as a little boy, as a little toddler, and to build with you. But I was never there, and so you were alone. Son, can you forgive me for not being there to play with you as a little baby? And I remember thinking to myself, why are we playing house in front of 500 people? This is so stupid. Oh, I feel so dumb. I wish I hadn't said yes to this. That's what, that was my first thought. But it was too late. You're not getting out of it now. And so I just said, dear Lord, please help me. Whatever, lean into this situation. Help me to get through this moment. And so I just imagined in my mind those IOUs he was talking about. And I just imagined me pulling one of them out that said, not there to play with me. And I said, and by the way, they had two microphones, one in front of my mouth, one in front of his. So it was, the whole thing was just as, as uncomfortable as it could ever be. <laughs> and so this microphone in my mouth, and I just said, yes, dad, <laughs> I forgive you. And in my mind, I just imagined myself taking that one IOU, ripping it up, and dropping it on the floor. Then he said, son, as you got older, you just needed a dad. You needed a dad all sorts of times, but you needed a dad who would just be there for you to to throw a ball with you and teach you how to catch. And there were so many times as a young boy where you just, you felt so out of place. You, you never felt like you fit in and, 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 you, and you were awkward in sports and you wouldn't have been if I was there, if I had been there just to, just to throw that ball with you and spend that time with you and help you. you that wouldn't have been the case. And oh, Son, I'm so sorry and I owe you a debt. Can you forgive that debt? Can you forgive me? And I said, yeah, I, I can forgive you for that too. And I just imagined another IOU, never there to throw a ball. And in my heart, I just took it and I ripped it up and dropped it on the floor. He said, son, I love to hunt. I love to fish. And I know God put me in your life to teach you these things. I love the outdoors and you would have loved spending time with me out in the wilderness. And man, I wish I was there to teach you how to build a fire, but I never was. And you had to figure this stuff out on your own and never there to teach you how to hunt and do some of these outdoorsy things that were in your heart to do, but you never had the opportunity, son. I am so sorry. That was my job. I owe you a debt. Can you forgive me for the debt of love that I didn't pay to you? And I saw, saw that other IOU, and now I'm starting to lean into this experience. I'm starting to feel it, and I'm, I'm sobbing by this point. And I said, yeah, Dad, I forgive you for that too. And I just took that IOU that talked about fishing and hunting, and I dropped it on the floor. He said, son, as you began to mature into a young man, there's times where you just needed me to explain things to you about life and about being a man and about being mature. At this point, I'm thinking about the lust book. He said, son, you just needed a dad to tell you that you were all right. You just needed a dad to tell you that everything was working okay. You just needed a dad to, to just confirm to you who you were and that you were a healthy young man and to teach you how to be a man of God. Son, I was supposed to be there, and I wasn't. Can you forgive me for that? I said, yes, Dad, and I'm bawling now. I took out the IOU that said lust book on it, and I said, I forgive you for that too. 
I let you go. I let it go. He said, son, and he, and he just went through. And some of these things were things that we talked about before the meeting. Some of the things were just things that uh, he was getting prophetically uh, at the moment. But he took his time. It was like a 15, maybe 20 minute process. He just took his time one by one slowly just went through everything that came bubbling up in his heart and one by one I just tore it up tore it up and I cried and sobbed and and tore these things up and 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 just in my own imagination I just saw just sheets of ripped up paper all over the floor and I remember the last thing I thought we were done it seemed like we were done and then he the last thing he said he says son I have one more thing I need to ask you to forgive me for he said son I want to ask you to forgive me for what I did to your mother. She she needed me so badly. Two little boys and pregnant with a little girl and how I just, I took the easy way out and I left this world and I left her all on her own to figure things out. Son, she needed me and I wasn't there for years and years and years. She paid a major price because of that. Son, can you forgive me for what you did to what I did to your mom? And I remember that was the hardest one. I remember that was there was a little tiny moment where I just thought, you know what? I'll forgive you for the way you hurt me. But that's where I draw the line. How could you do that? How could you do that to my mom? How could you leave her like that? She was such an amazing, beautiful woman. How could you do such a thing? But even in that moment as I was wrestling, I could just sense the Holy Spirit saying, Steve. There's nothing for you here in this prison. There's no advantage to holding this debt. You get nothing from it. Let it go, son. And so I said, yes, dad. And I took out that last IOU and I said, I forgive you for hurting my mother too. I release you. I let it go. And when I just said that, I thought we were done. And then he leaned back and he said, now I want you to put your head on my other shoulder. (laughs) Which is even a bigger hug, you know. (laughs) And he said, now son, now I want to talk to you on behalf of your real father, your heavenly father. And son, I want to tell you, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of the man that you've become. I'm so proud of the way you have overcome obstacles in your life. I'm so proud of the way that you have walked with me and served me. And even when it wasn't hard, when it wasn't easy, you kept pressing it. And son, I'm so proud of the way that you have just forgiven your biological father, your earthly father, because I have wanted this for a very long time. Because right now, because of what you've just done, you and I are now able to go to a whole new place together. And I'm going to be able to take that place. And I'm going to father you in ways that I've never been able to father you before. I am so proud of you. And I remember him ending with this. He said, you are my son. You've never been alone. When you were playing with those those blocks as a little child, I was playing with you. When you were rejected, I was standing there comforting you. Through every season and every hurt, I have always been there. I've never left you. I have never forsaken you. And I never will. And son, remember he ended with this. He said, you are my son whom I love. And in you, I am well pleased. You're a good hugger, you know that. (laughs) Can you give him a hand for suffering that long? And, uh, And then he said, okay, Steve, stand up. And I stood up. And uh, I, I mean, I, when I stood up, I was different. It was like, whatever that prison was, it, it was unlocked. And when I stepped up, I, I stood up, it was just like some, a door was wide open and I knew I was free to walk out of it. And he said to me, he said, well, Steve, how do you feel? 
And I remember always, I always wished I said something cooler, but <laughs> I said, and this is how it felt. I said, I feel like I'm in a cloud of daddy. <laughs> so, so cheesy. But that's what I said. It is what it is. It's a true story. You know, 500 people. But I look up and there's like literally out of 500 people, there's 300 people bawling their eyes out. And there's tissue boxes going up and down every aisle. People later that week said, Steve, while God was healing you, he was healing me. While you were forgiving your dad, I was tearing up my own IOUs and forgiving mine. And uh, I looked up and I said, I feel like I, I'm just, I, feel, I feel different. I'm like, I feel like I'm in a cloud of doubt. I feel so much love. I just feel so much love. And so I, 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 he's like, all right, you're free to go. And so I started to walk. And when I got to about here, the guy who was set, sitting right here in the front row, he just stood right up and just buried his head in my chest and just hugged me. And honestly, I mean, I'm, remember, I'm not a hugger, okay? I've never been a hugger. I'm not like one of those... Uh, intimately, I don't do that. Well, this guy just hugs me, and I feel extraordinary love for this guy. Total stranger. And we just hug, and it's wonderful. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> when, I, when he let go, I took another step, and the lady here, she just hugged me. And then, and then it was someone else. And literally, I probably hugged 50 people before I got out of that room. It was just one after another after another. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was for the first time ever. And I'm loving it. I'm feeling it. And, and later on, I mean, it was, if there's ever been, I mean, people who knew me before and who knew me after, they would say it was probably more, tra that experience was probably more visibly transformational than even my salvation. I was one way before. I was a total a different way after. Even when I uh, got home, uh, my, the youth pastor who wanted to fire me, Graydon, instantly we connected. Instantly we got along. Instantly we just started, this friendship began to develop and we became very close friends. I remember about a week later, I was, I was uh, preaching to a bunch of youth at our church and I, I remember, I think I was preaching on the Father Heart of God and I preached for about whatever, an hour, I just went on and on. I can't remember what I said when I was done. I just kind of said, well, um, okay, well, if anyone wants prayer, I guess, uh, you know, I'm here. And uh, one girl jumped up. She's like 13 years old. How many of you know Nikki Mathis? Yeah. Great worship leader. I was her junior high youth pastor. <laughs> she jumped up, run to me, buried her head in my chest, and just started sobbing. And when I hugged her, I just felt the father's love just coming through me into this young woman. And she just melted into a puddle. Then another kid right there, boom, buried. And then another one. I look up, the whole group, like probably 100 kids, they're all in a straight line going out the back door. None of them wanted prayer. Everyone wanted a hug. It was just, and I'd hug them. And I could feel God just loving people through me. It was a, like for the first time in my life ever, this way, I, I could be like a conduit of love. When I left that meeting that night, I hugged like 20 other people in the parking lot. And when I ran out of people, I actually hugged the light pole. That's a true story. <laughs> I've been hugging everything ever since. I mean, literally, that was 1999. It was 24 years ago. I was able to fall in love and, uh, with my wife, and uh, we have children. We have five children. Uh, I've, from that day, I, always, I used to, here's the thing. I used to always say, from that day till this, I have just been a really lovey guy. But the truth is, and I, haven't, I don't usually tell this part of the story, there is a little window in my story about six years later where I decided to just go back into my prison. And uh, I've never shared this part of the story in this message before, but uh, it was about six years later, I was, uh, I was on staff at a church and I'm, I'm like the Steve, the hug guy. I, I'm like people would call, hey, I want a Steve hug, you know? And I mean, I just hug people all the time. I just, I mean, it actually became a part of my ministry. And, and to this day, it's just, I just minister to people. I just love people. And I, just, I feel like it's, I, sometimes I feel like I do more through hug than I do even through prayer. But about six years later, I was on staff of this church uh, in Calgary. And uh, I, um, 
I started to bang heads with a spiritual father in my life. That summer of my healing, 1999, that, at that pastor's camp, three men uh, who just really latched on to me and really started to sow into me and they became spiritual fathers in my life. And um, one of them was Dennis Wiedrich. Uh, at the end of the week, actually, him and his wife sat down with me and they said, Steve, we live in Ontario, but we just feel sick about leaving you. Like, we just feel so connected to you. We just want to keep in touch. And like, like and they're, they're asking for my phone number and this and that. And, uh, and Katie said, like, so like, so your, your mom died, your dad died? Like, I said, yeah. She's like, so where do you spend Christmas? And I said, I don't know. She says, you're coming to my house. <laughs> you know? And she said, where do you spend Easter? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, you're coming to my house. And they, they just started to make plans for me to be at all the family gatherings. And, and even before I left that camp, they said, I know this may sound odd, but would you be like, would you be interested in just being part of our family? Like, could we like adopt you? Like, could we like be your mom and dad? And, uh, I love Dennis and I love Katie. And I honestly, I never thought it would last. I never thought it would last. But I loved them and I thought, I'm gonna enjoy it as long as it does. I mean, how many people can they, I mean, they, they minister to people all over the place. How long can this last? I'll tell you what, four years later, after a uh, uh, 100 visits and, and deep connection, four years later, they sat me down and said, Steve, just so you know, we met with our children, we met with the lawyer, we've redone our will, you have an equal share with all of our children. That was the penny dro- when the penny dropped. I really have a home. I'm really part of a family. I'm not an orphan anymore. You know, but um, so anyways, I walked with them and we just fell in love and I fell in love with a woman. We got married and, and life, life went on in a way better way because I wasn't living in a spiritual prison. But about six years later, I started to bump heads with one of my spiritual fathers who was a prophet, very, some of you would know him and I'm not saying his name, but a uh, very, very anointed prophet with very strong prophetic gifts. He'd tell you stuff that you would never guess, you know, but I could see in him that things were starting to get a little bit twisted. And I was starting to taste things in him that just didn't feel pure and holy and right. And he could tell, because he was very discerning, <laughs> he could tell that I was pulling away from him. I wasn't comfortable the way, the way he was ministering, especially to women. I could tell there was lust issues in his life, and I could, just, I could feel it when I was around him. And also finances, I could just see that he was, it was just becoming very money grabby. And so I, I had some strong opinions, and I was a young evangelist, uh, and I had a little bit of discernment, and I had a big mouth, a little bit of attitude. And so I started to see this stuff, and I start pulling away. Well, when I started pulling away, he kind of, he could feel it, and then he started kind of attacking me and coming against me. And even publicly in ministry settings, he would like point me out and like, like just do these little offsided shots and criticisms, even publicly. Well, now I'm mad, you know, and, and this, 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 this little, uh, I had a bee in my bonnet, <laughs> okay? It be, can't, it be, have you ever had a, do you know what a bee in a bonnet is? A bonnet is a hat. And if you have a bee in your bonnet, you can't think about anything else, okay? You can't think about anything else. All you can think about is, oh my gosh. Some of you have a bee in your bonnet today. And God wants to get it out. Well, I had a bee in my bonnet and I couldn't think about anything else except this guy. And I know he's getting trouble and I know things are gonna get bad. I know things are gonna get ugly. And then finally I went to the pastor of my church who was kind of a pastor over both of us. You know, I was the evangelist, he's the prophet, and here's the pastor. But they were both like spiritual fathers to me. And uh, I went to him and I said, you need to deal with this guy because things are going to get ugly. And I remember sitting in Earl's having a lunch with this guy. And he's like, no, I think you're probably just getting into some judgment, Steve. And I said, no, I'm not getting into judgment. I'm telling you, this is a fact. And I know this guy's going to mess up. And I know he's going to hurt people. In fact, I know if you don't do something quick, this is going to affect marriages because he's going to be sleeping with women in this church. It's going to get ugly. Not only that, and I started talking about money. He's going to clean you guys out financially. And he's just, whoa, Steve, just slow down. 
And I said, I'm not slowing down. If this is going to get bad, and it'll be your fault because you didn't do anything about it. And I got right in his face. And he fired me. <laughs> uh, he didn't like to have, I was a son, and I had no heart of sonship in my voice. I was mad. I was arrogant. I was proud. I was pointing my finger in his face. I was telling him what to do. And uh, he didn't like it, and he thought I was wrong. He genuinely thought I was wrong. And so he fired me, and, um, and when he fired me, that was like kind of half of our income, because I was half time there, and half time I traveled and preached in little churches here and there and everywhere. I used to speak in every little hick town you never heard of. But when he fired me, he sent out an email, to, or a letter or email or whatever, to the whole church, and let them know, please don't contact Steve, give him some space, he's not in a good place. And, uh, and so we lost all our friends in like one day. My wife actually worked for a guy in the church. He fired her because he wasn't allowed to talk to us. And so I lost my job. She lost her job. All our friends just shut us out. And then on top of that, all the churches that I would normally preach in and minister to, they all started to hear this little rumor going around that Steve Holmstrom is against the prophetic and he's trying to stone the prophets. And so all of a sudden, my phone stops ringing. Nobody wants me to come preach in their church anymore. Nobody's interested in Steve Holmstrom's ministry. I didn't get any calls from Lethbridge in those days, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, and I was sitting at home, chain smoking <laughs> cigar cigars and cigarettes, just praying, God, open a door because I need money. I'm going broke. And uh, a few months goes by, and we just get like, we got like $100,000 into debt, and my wife is, she got a job at a coffee shop. She's trying to provide for us, but she's mad at me because I'm not making money, and I, I wouldn't go get a job. And uh, because for me, I was like, I'm not getting a job. I'm an evangelist. I live by faith. <laughs> well, no, I wasn't living by faith. I was going broke. I was going into debt by faith. <laughs> and uh, eventually, my spiritual mom, Katie, came to me, and she said, honey, she, oh, I was so mad. I didn't speak to her for three months after this. She said, honey, a real man provides for his family. <laughs> and you're not providing for your family. You need to get a job. I was so angry. What? I'm, you don't think I'm a man? <laughs> I'm a man of faith. Where's your faith? Why don't you believe? I didn't do anything wrong. I was right. They're wrong. They're rejecting me. You see my bee in my bonnet? <laughs> and I knew I was right. And the truth is, I was right. I was right in the head and wrong in the heart. And what do you think matters most to God? But anyways, I didn't speak to her for three months, but I did go and get a job. And I moved to Drayton Valley, and I got a job in the oil patch. And I was so ashamed. I was so mad, and I was so hurt because my ministry was over. I'll probably never preach again. And I don't have any skills or any talents, but I found some guy who would hire me. And I moved to Drayton Valley. I'll get the worship team to come up. I'm going to start winding down here shortly. But uh, as um, I moved to Drayton Valley, and uh, I just started drinking. This is chapter one of my book. This is why. And I don't get into all the details in my book. My marriage was falling apart. She had no respect for me. I, was, I could feel that she didn't respect me and then I was mad at her and so we were just at each other's throats and I just started drinking like a fish and uh, I was drunk every single day for five years from 2005 to 2010 I just drank every single night in my garage and uh, and I still loved God even in that season drunk as a skunk I'd be like listening to Kenneth Hagin sermons and <laughs> And crying out to God, Lord, one day I'm going to serve you again. Are you done with me? Aren't you ever going to use me again? You know, but I, I, I love the Lord, but I also, I just, I just started to slide into drunkenness and I started to slide into compromise. Uh, and uh, what was interesting was a year after being drunk in the garage, I got an email from that pastor who fired me. And uh, he said, Steve, I'm... I want to repent to you. Please forgive us for firing you and kicking you out. Everything you said was right. Everything you said that would happen did happen. He ended up sleeping with multiple women in the church, which was devastating to many marriages, and then even molested a couple of young underage girls. 
He went to prison for that. He said, can you forgive me for firing you? Can you forgive me for not believing you? And I read that email. I was sitting in the garage. I can still remember. I read that email and I just cracked another beer and said, well, you should have listened <laughs> and stayed drunk for four more years. <laughs> and you know what? I crawled right back into that spiritual prison. For five years, I stayed in that prison because they were wrong. And I was right. And I told them. And why didn't they listen? And how could they do this to me? And did you know you can be absolutely right behind your bars? You can be absolutely right with your stack full of IOUs and live in that spiritual prison for the rest of your life. But Jesus says, unless you forgive from your heart, this is what's going to happen to you. I know that tonight and it may not even feel, you may not feel the cloud of daddy. Maybe you will. But I know that tonight there are people, and I'll even give you a few of these if you need, but there are people who are going to come to this altar, they're going to tear up some debts, and their lives will never be the same again. Hallelujah! Never the same again. Because, you know, when you turn a key and unlock a door, it doesn't even have to be emotional. Do you get emotional every time you unlock your front door? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yay! No. But you know, you can stand in front of that door with the wrong key for 10 years and get really, really, really mad that it won't open. And you can bang on that door with the wrong key over and over. And you can say, God, if you loved me, this door would open. But it has nothing to do with God's love for you. And it has everything to do with you not using the right key. And I want to tell you something. Forgiveness is the key. Forgiveness is the key. You know, we talked about faith yesterday. We talked about faith. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. And in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, it's interesting. Jesus says... Therefore I say to you, all things that you pray for and ask, believe that you have received them and it will be granted to you. And that's usually where we stop reading. But let's just read on one more verse just for fun. After the most popular faith verse in all the Bible, believe you have received, it'll be yours. And then he says, but whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, I'm going to say that again. If you have anything against anyone, say it with me. If I have anything against anyone, forgive so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. I think a lot of times people read that and they think that means, oh, so if I don't forgive, I'm going to go to hell. God won't forgive my sins. No, I don't think it's about that. I think it has everything to do with this spiritual prison. This is what my, how my heavenly Father will treat each of you if you do not forgive from your heart. And he says, so make sure you forgive. Because when you forgive, I believe it gives the Father, the King, permission to unlock your prison and to let you out. Many of the tormentors that have been tormenting you, many of the difficulties that have been smashing against you, you need to know. You can be you may not even think about it anymore. But if you got these in your back pocket, it's costing you. For sure, it's costing you. After five years of the prison, I decided it wasn't worth it 
to stay bitter. It wasn't worth it to be miserable. After five years in my garage, I already knew how to get out because I had been set free from a prison years earlier. I knew why I was locked up. Not even during that five years, I was a recluse again. All the relationships ended. My relationship with my wife was horrible. My relationships with my kid was awful. Except for Benny. Because I'd always get so drunk, my wife wouldn't want to sleep with me, so I'd crawl into bed with him, and he loved me. <laughs> he was like four years old. Oh, Dad, you're sleeping with me again? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. If I was God, I would have thrown Stephen in the garbage in 2007. I would have said, boy, I don't use people like you. I don't use people like you. Are you thankful for his mercy? I don't care how long you've been in your prison. You could come out tonight. You can come out right now. Whether you feel it or not, you tear that thing up. Does that mean you trust that person? Not necessarily. Does that mean that you're going to run back to relationship with that person who hurt you? Not necessarily. But it means you're going to stop whining about it. You're going to stop grumbling about it. You're going to stop talking about it because that person doesn't owe you anything anymore. The debt is canceled. For some of you, it's even an actual financial debt. Oh, you didn't want me to say that. Ha <laughs> ha might just have to just send a text and say, hey, that five grand you owe me, you don't owe me anymore. I forgive it. Hallelujah. Say amen or say oh my. Freedom. Freedom. It's, it's so much easier than you think. You don't, like I say, you don't have to you don't have to run back to a relationship. You don't have to trust, but you do have to cancel the debt. And once you cancel the debt, what that means is you don't owe me anything anymore. You don't even owe me an apology. You're forgiven. And then you walk forward and God gives you grace and you'd be surprised. I've forgiven some people who just really, really ripped my heart out and I thought I could never love them again. And five months later, six months later, I see them somewhere and I actually feel my heart move with love. God can do in you what you can't do or what you can't make happen. But you have to do your part. You have to make a choice. It's just a choice. I choose to cancel this debt. I make a choice to cancel the debt. And you say it with your mouth. You say it out loud. You can come to this altar. You can take it in front of you. You see it. And you say, I make a choice today. Father, you're listening. Heaven's listening. The angels are listening. Kingdom's around. I just say out loud. In the name of Jesus Christ, I cancel that debt. They don't owe me anything anymore. It's forgiven and rip it up. Hallelujah. So we're going to, uh, we're just going to go into worship. And uh, you're free. You're free to, by the way, you're free to leave too. You're free to stay. You're free to leave. Usually we get a good little group of young people and talk till midnight. But, uh, Boy, we have some good times. Wasn't the last night fun? Ah, I'm so proud of you guys. Leaning into God, saying yes, hungry. Are you going to rip up some IOUs? You want two? You want three? Okay. Well, ooh, six. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Friends, we got to live this way. It's not like, oh, I... I don't want anyone to know. Friends, probably almost every one of us has some IOUs. How many got a couple of IOUs in your back pocket? Well, you can come. There's an anointing even in this room. There's a grace right now. I really believe that. There's a grace for breakthrough. So I'd say, don't take them with you out of this place. If you want to do it in your chair or you want to come to the front, if you come up here, we're probably going to put our hands on you. And I'm probably going to hug you. So be warned ahead of time. But, uh, but don't take them home with you. Father, I thank you for your presence here in this room. I thank you for your precious holy written word, which gives us keys for breakthrough and for transformation in our lives. And God, I pray 
that as people bring these debts before you and tear them up, I pray that you would unlock prisons tonight. I pray that you would unlock prisons and that people would instantly experience freedom in their life. New relationships. God, new breakthroughs. I thank you, Lord, for people who have walked alone for decades and never knew why, never knew why, what was keeping them from others. Lord, I thank you that tonight is a night of a new beginning and breakthrough. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, why don't you stand up? We're going to go back into worship, but the altar is open. And uh, if you've got some IOUs you need to tear up, I'd encourage you, find a place on your knees and, uh, and do that. O- altar is open.